So welcome back to another edition of the Impact Sessions with me, Nick Bramley. This is a very special edition. It's our 50th edition of the podcast. And what better way to celebrate that than with a beer? The reason I'm celebrating with a beer is we're meeting Kate Balchin. She's Director of Sales, Marketing and Export at World Top Brewery. World Top Brewery is a client of mine, worked with them on and off for a number of years. Fabulous beer, fabulous company, fabulous family business. So without further ado, let's meet Kate. So, Kate, welcome to the Impact Sessions podcast. Uh, thanks, Nick. Thanks for having me. Hello. No problem at all. You've got a great story to tell. We're going to explore that a little bit. Um, it seemed appropriate. It would be a shame not to celebrate 50 podcasts with something of, uh, of, of a, a celebratory drink. You make fabulous beer, so why not? Um, you're responsible for sales, marketing, and the growth of one of York's favourite brews, which is World Top. Um we're about to reopen the likes of hospitality events and even larger scale weddings. So let's discuss the journey and, and what your diversification has been all about and where we're going now with World Top. So for those who don't know, you are probably the most appropriately named brewery because geographically you sit right on top of the rolling Yorkshire worlds between Scarborough, Filey and I guess Bridlington really. It's a beautiful, beautiful spot. Um, but it's not a long-standing tradition for the family, is it? You've been doing brewing for about 18 years, as far as I understand. How did World Top Brewery come about from being a farming business? Well, yeah, like you say, obviously, we're right on top of the walls, uh, out near the coast. Um, if we stand on top of the house, we can just about see the sea. Um, but, yeah, we've been a farm here since the Second World War. My great-grandfather came over from West Yorkshire as a bit of a change. And... Um, Basically, yeah, you've been doing some farming, a uh, little bit of arable, a little bit of stock and things. And then when my dad, um, Tom, came into the business in the late 80s, he started really looking at how we can diversify and, and kind of come away from the traditional just growing the crops and raising the animals kind of side of things. So he went, he, he did an awful lot of, uh, of uh, trial and error stuff, you know, raising Christmas turkeys and uh, free range eggs you know, potatoes, peas, all of that stuff. And then, and as it came to the uh, late 1990s and the early 2000s, when farm incomes were really struggling and there was a lot of kind of questions about what was going to happen, I mean, not helped by kind of things like foot and mouth as well, um, that we, you know, he started to look at what else we could be doing. And, and it just so happened that there was a guy in York who, who set up breweries and that was his job. He used to work for Sam Smith's and some of the bigger boys and, and he kind of was a brewing consultant. And they got chatting about things. And one of the things that we have up here, which not a lot of people know about is that this area of the country, the Wolds are absolutely great for growing malting barley. It's all to do with the chalky soil and just the kind of the fact that it's not really suitable for anything else, but malting barley really, really works. So that's why there's a massive great mal uh, malting plant at well there's one at West Napton and then there's one at um just outside of Flamborough um Bridlington way and basically all the malt comes off of well all the barley comes off the fields from all these East Yorkshire farms around the world goes to the maltings and then it's all shipped up to Scotland to be turned into Scotch whiskey so you know it seemed daft that we were sending beer uh, you know malting barley off that way and not using it in this area and um having our own water supply on the farm as well kind of meant that you know we didn't have to think about how we would access the amount of water needed for brewing it was just all there and um yeah that was that was kind of the two things that that really kicked in the brewing idea so it was an opportunity having met somebody in york who sets up breweries but you were sat on top of all the raw materials you ever needed to make some decent beers then weren't you yeah, exactly. I mean, we struggle with hops. We have tried to grow some hops, but it's just a bit too cold and windy up here. Mm. Um, if we could find somewhere nice and sheltered, that would probably be better. But yeah, and, and also there was, you know, the, at that time, DEFRA was very much into farm diversification as well. And there were lots of grants available. And mm. the guys at the Yorkshire Agricultural Society and Yorkshire Forward, they could they could provide quite a lot of help that way as well, which we were very fortunate to be kind of in the right place at the right time for. Good stuff. I mean, 2003, I think, is when you established the first sort of brew uh, coming through on, on the brewery. Um, can you remember the ambitions of the brewery at the time, you know, from a, a, a diversification, maybe necessity, 
to where we've now got a brewery. Can you imagine, can you remember what your dad, Tom's ambitions were at the time for, for, for taking World Top forward? I mean, I can't, I don't know what his initial plans were. I mean, without giving too much away, I was still kind of towards the latter end of school at this point. Um, but um, so did not massively involved in the day to day side, side of things. But I know that he's always mentioned and that he's always talked about the fact that the farm gives us our livelihood and it gives us our place to live and it provides us with everything. So everything we do is to try and make sure that that livelihood and that farm and that kind of living can be maintained. And so the brewery is a way of us being able to use the, the barley that we're growing ourselves without having to be reliant on other people's prices and, and the, you know, the volatile corn markets and grain markets. And, and so that's basically the, the main ambition is not was never to be a multi-million pound winning business that, uh, you know, that needed that was up for sale and to the highest bidder kind of thing. It was just all about creating a sustainable family business that would secure things for generations to come. Well, I think it's fair to say that you have achieved that and more. We'll explore the journey and where you are to date really a little bit. Um, Microbrewing has become very popular in recent years and, and, you know, there's lots of entrance to the market. People are doing it from back rooms and, and garden bars and all that kind of thing. Um, you were early into this kind of market before it was particularly saturated. Um, was it initially just kegs to local pubs or was there always a facility with things like bottling plants and stuff at the start of, uh, of the world top journey? Yeah, so initially, as you say, we were one of the first ones kind of to take to become a small microbrewery as it, as it was. Um, I think when we started, there was maybe 250 independent, small independent microbreweries in the UK. I mean, I'm not talking about your Marston's and your Heineken and, and all those guys. But now, and I think now we've just hit 3,000. So, you know, in the last 18 years, there's been a heck of an explosion of, of companies and businesses. Um, and I think, yeah, so initially for us, yeah, it was very much knocking on pub doors, ringing them up and saying, I've got some locally brewed beers here. Will you take a couple of casks, put them on, see what you think, and then going back and hopefully they'd liked it and, and would buy it again. The bottles were small fry at this point. They were, you know, we'd get them for farmers markets. There would be a few farm shops that would stock them. But other than that, it was mainly just the casks out to the to the pubs. But even then, farm shops weren't particularly flourishing and popular. They seem to, and farmers markets are a relatively newish phenomenon, aren't they? You, you've been going 18 years. I think the farmers markets 18 years ago have been few and far between. Now they're extremely popular. So it's interesting, I guess, to see the starting point was we've got the ability to brew. We can make some really nice beers. We'll take them door to door and we'll, you know, we'll sell them to, uh, to, to, to pubs who are, the natural trade for that um it might be worth exploring some of the journey from there to where the brewery is right now in terms of scale and size and capacity because you know it's fair to say you're not a microbrewery anymore is it um I, you know i've termed the phrase macro brewery is that even a thing would you class yourself you're not a, you're not a, a newcastle you're not a, a heineken but you, you you're not far off being you know the next level down from size and that are you well, I mean, we're still a fair way off. I think what, one of the things that Alex, my husband, likes to say is that our entire year production is the equivalent of one day at the John Smith's factory on the 1st of January. Um, but, you know, so we, we, are, we are still fairly small, Fry. But what I would say is rather than being a microbrewery, we are more of a small independent than a, a micro. I think there's a, there's a, there's a basically a level. So below you can produce however much you produce in a year, but up to 5,000 hectolitres, you get a, a kind of a relief on the duty rate that HMRC charges on sales of, of alcohol. And, and that is basically what's enabled this huge surge in microbreweries and smaller breweries to kind of come into being because they can actually start to compete at a level that they can, you know, they can competitively price because they're not paying all the duty they're just paying a half rate mm. we are we've passed that level now and we're now on what's known as the sliding scale which is basically a nice curve that goes all the way up to 10,000 hectoliters where you no, sorry 60,000 hectoliters where you get to have to pay full rate duty no matter what size you are mm. um, so there's a bit of 
yeah I, that it's one of the things that's at the moment that we're kind of having to factor in a lot more is this this whole kind of bre- you know going through that glass ceiling of the 5000 and kind of working our way up yeah um, okay yeah well let, let's explore where you are now in the journey there, there must have been some high points on the way I, I was working with you as you put in new brewery, brewing plant a, a number of years ago that's a massive investment it's also a massive I remember Alex, your uh, master brewer husband, was all hands to the pump, if you pardon the expression, trying to get that set up and established and things. So you must have been some high points in terms of capacity. What's the scale of the business now in terms of, you know, um, size of customer base for, for your, your, your kegs and your casks, not the, the casks, are not kegs, um, and also your brewing and your bottling and things. It, it's a significantly different business to what it was in 2003, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the we've still got the local pub market, the, you know, the, the ones where we deliver into Scarborough and Bridlington and, and York and, and places like that. It is harder to be in those markets now because there is a lot more competition for those pumps because a pub's only got two or three handfuls that you can put beer on, whereas, you know, a bottle shop has X amount of shelves. So there's a, there's a lot more opportunity there. Um, I mean, we've got I mean, like you said, you came when we were um, putting one uh, an upgrade into the brew kit. Well, I mean, we'd previously, I think, done an, <laughs> doubled in capacity. So we started off and then we doubled in capacity and thought that that would keep us going for the next five to 10 years. But actually, three years down the line, we soon realised that that was not going to happen. So we had to, to up it again. Um, at the moment, we can probably, well, we're not at full capacity, um, thanks to uh, that nice little pandemic we're currently going through um but we've definitely we future proofed ourselves for a lot longer now and um customer wise um we've probably got kind of two to three hundred kind of active pub customers and on trade customers so smaller bottle shops restaurants bars pubs um but then also we've we've added in the some of the major retailers kind of the supermarket wholesalers that kind of stuff to just get us further afield and, and some bigger volume we're going to explore the shell space bit in a minute but I'm, I'm interested in the um taking world top from the top of the yorkshire worlds into uh, other export markets and i know and i picked on one i know from our previous conversations that you're hugely popular in italy which is you know they've got their own peronis and all the other things that go with that um how is it in terms of getting shelf space and, and, and working on an export level? How do you get to be popular in Italy? Well, it's, it's really interesting. Um, we, we don't really know why we are so popular in Italy. We're very grateful that we are very popular in Italy. I think it's something to do with the, you, you know, the kind of the culture as well. You know, for as much as we're English and they're Italian, our actual cultures are quite similar in the fact that we all value family business it's all about the sustainability and and you know the italians are very much family orientated they love working with small family businesses that they can you know the md can chat to the md kind of thing rather than having to go through three lots of secretaries and two board meetings before you get an answer for anything so there's that's one of the reasons and also i think you know they really just appreciate the the ethics and the ethos behind our our brand so they appreciate the homegrownness and the 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 hands-on approach and that kind of the just the I guess the real life kind of um element of it and the fact that they can ring us up and chat to us and we'll go out there and visit the pubs with them and and and, you know meet meet the families and chat and, and just generally enjoy being out there. Well, they're, they're also a big bottled beer drinking consumer country as well, aren't they? You know, so again, culturally, there's a good fit there, I guess, isn't there, on that basis? Um, without giving out too many trade secrets, percentage-wise, what would you say the business is based on in terms of percentage of kegs to local pubs, percentage of bottle sales in the UK, percentage of export? Where does World Top roughly sit in those kind of uh, elements, really? Well, pre, pre-COVID, I would have said that... <clears throat> 15 to 20 percent of our bottles and keg sales and when i say kegs i mean kegs as in lager kegs rather than cask handful beers would yeah. be so i would have said 15 to 20 percent we would have sent out to export yeah. 
And then of the stuff that remains in the UK, I would say there's about a, a 70, 30, 60, 40 split between bottles and casks. So mm. bottles is the bigger element of our sales and then casks are the, are the, are the lower end. Um, yeah. So you mentioned to me off air that COVID's had a, a really strange effect on what you feel the business now is. I mean, obviously, bottled beers have gone really through the roof. A lot of people have been drinking from home and probably drinking to excess to a certain extent, whereas your traditional market for pubs and hospitality have, have had some real challenges. Yeah. How, how's the business been? What, what's the effect of COVID been on the business then overall, Kev? Well, I mean, yeah, like like we were chatting just, just previous to the podcast, um, we, we literally went from a business where we were supplying direct to pubs to a business where we were supplying via courier direct to our customers. So we, I think our, our courier kind of internet orders that we were then dispatching out all over the country, I think we went up by about 1,025% in a year in terms of how much we were processing. I mean, our poor web guys were just beyond themselves because it was just bombarding them with questions every day saying, how can we make this more streamlined process? We can't keep manually entering 100 different orders into our uh, invoicing system. And um, so it was a bit nuts, but it's helped us go. It's, it's made sure we could keep brewing. It's meant that we could keep most of our staff on. And it's just, it's been amazing, actually. See, and seeing where the beer goes as well, you know, all the way down to Cornwall and up to the highest bits of Scotland, it's it's really nice to know that we've got that spread all the way out there. That's because your beer is bloody awesome, Kate. That's why. And I'm a big fan. I will explore your brands across the the. the the, the brew uh, later but I'm interested in shelf space as well because yeah. it's, you know it's hugely competitive in a supermarket or even other smaller you know like farm shops and stuff um how do you fare now the market's like massively more crowded than it was before you know how do people get hold of, of world top beer then if they can do it through the website obviously but how do they do it on the supermarket shelves how do you maintain your supermarket position it's a tricky one and it's a balancing act. We, at the moment, have our, our kind of supermarket and major retailer listings are all quite regional based. So although we're in Morrison's, it's the northern based Morrison stores that we will be in. Same with Sainsbury's uh, and Asda and things like that. What we're doing, I think what we have to do is just once we've got that space on the shelf, which you get by hopefully offering a, a beer that they've not got one of before. And we we actually work with a consultant on this who's pre, got lots of previous retail experience. So he can negotiate with buyers for us and actually kind of maintain that relationship. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, so it's, it's all about the rate of sale with them. So, you know, if you're selling more than eight bottles per store per week you're probably okay but if it starts to dip below that then they'll start asking questions and you'll maybe get you know there'll be a range review and, and that's it you're gone um there's different things you can do quite a lot of them do promotional periods that you can submit things for but we tend to try and stay away from that where possible because obviously that just kind of devalues the price even more than it i mean it already is it's just hard because the supermarkets will use you as a loss leader. So that's that's the main issue on that one. Well, I, I guess looking at that, you're also looking and saying your marketing role as part of your, you've got sales marketing export. That's a hell of a responsibility, by the way, Kate. That's a lot of jobs. Uh, your marketing role is all about, you know, building brand loyalty. So people, when they see it on the shelves, are drawn to, they know, they trust, and they enjoy the product, I guess. So, um and, and, and I guess the more successful you are, the more eye level you get on the shelves rather than the bottom shelf or top shelf type thing. Is that all part of the process? I mean, I'd like to think that the more successful you are, the higher up the shelves you go. A lot of people do it alphabetically, which is where we maybe have kicked ourselves in the teeth by being a brewery that starts with a W. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, yeah, the marketing thing is massively key. I mean, I spend quite a lot of my time planning social media you know posts marketing campaigns looking at pr opportunities and just getting the brand out there you know maybe people go oh no not world top again but maybe they'll remember it and actually then they'll see it on the shelf and think actually i like that or even it's just with the supermarkets and with the online sales what i think we've found is that a lot of people who've kind of holidayed in yorkshire on on the yorkshire coast they'll have tried the beer in a pub or in a local supermarket over here and then they'll come and search it out again online which is a really nice kind of way to do that 
Well, let's explore brands, okay? I'm, I'm going to slightly go off piece. We've got a, a number of questions. I'm going to go. It seems right to ask about your brands really at the moment, product as it were. Um, I know that before the pandemic, you were creating monthly or seasonal beers. So they reflected events or seasons or you had one called Hello Velo, which was a cycling theme because Yorkshire is the home of cycling for the UK or appears to be. You've got one called Scarborough Fair, which is an IPA. And you've even got um, a gluten-free beer against the grain. So how important is it for you to diversify your offering within the world top brewery brand to maintain some kind of level of um, consistency from customers and what would you consider your core brews yeah so we've got we've got our core range which we would say are beers like wild gold wild top bitter scarborough fair headland red angler's reward and against the grain and oh and, and marmalade porter they are beers that through popularity in cask and bottle we just produce year round every day and we will always have that those available but what we'd like to brew different things and our brewers like to have a chance to experiment so we've got things like like you say like hello velo which we actually brewed as a special for the when the um tour de france came to uh, Yorkshire for the Grand Depart and then we've kept it going because you know we we love cycling and lots of people love cycling and then there was the Tour de Yorkshire in um, um, that came through Scarborough and Bridlington a few years um, on the trot so that was and that's a lovely beer and it's kind of got its own following now so we've kept it on <clears throat> but then like you say we were doing monthly seasonals of cask beer which is what if you business sense wise Every time you ring a pub, they say, what have you got that's new? So in order to try and keep that fresh and to keep us on the bar, we've got to we 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 got to have some form of a rolling kind of program of different cask beers. That's quite a pressure point, isn't it? That, you know, it's like, you know, just we're really good at what we're good at. Take what we've got, but they're demanding something new and fresh and different all the time. Yeah, and I think as well, you, you know, you've got to think that the, the reason that they're asking that is because there's now 3,000 breweries in the UK. And in theory, I think in theory, even if you're just a Yorkshire pub, you could have a different beer on your bar every night of the week and you wouldn't repeat a brand, a brand or, a, or, or a beer, which is quite, a, a you know, it's quite an obstacle to overcome to try and get your product onto a, onto a, a, a handful in the first place. So there's the, there's the chance of having the, so there's the seasonal beers which you try and get into cask but then also because everything with the pandemic has switched much more to a drinking at home thing we actually for the first time this year have decided to bottle some of our monthly seasonal things as well so what we've done is kind of done a smaller brew and split it half for cask or mini cask because <laughs> we were hoping that pubs will be open in january but obviously we're four months down the road we've had to change a bit and then some into bottles and just have them as limited edition kind of when it's gone it's gone yeah. things and so at the moment we've got our viking range which you know yorkshire's got a huge viking um, heritage in it especially the area around us yeah. um and so we've got different beers named after different Viking gods and there's one coming out every month and it's a limited edition thing, which is just giving us a little bit more variety in terms of our offering without actually meaning that we're committing to a huge marketing budget. It's, it's, it's been that kind of uh, thing. So are, they, are those Viking beers for those? I mean, I know there are lots of people, I've got lots of friends who are big world top fans uh, and, you know, world gold and, and you bitter, et cetera. If they want to try the Viking beers, would they be shelf only or can you order them on the internet from you or how does that work? They are currently only available to buy from us direct. So you could buy them online on our website or you could, in theory, ring us up and, and order some. Uh, we've just opened Click and Collect again as an option. Our um, brewery shop isn't big enough to be COVID compliant at the moment. So mm. we have to do that way. Yeah. Well, let's, we've talked about product and, and, and it is a fabulous product. I'm delighted that we're exploring that on our 50th podcast. But let's talk about production as well. Um, you have in the past uh, brewed for others. Um, and I know capacity wise, you're probably not doing as much of that. But you also do a lot of bottling for other people now, don't you? So how did that come about? Because you're bottling effectively for some of your competitors, potentially. What's, what's the thinking and reasoning behind that? Well, the initial thinking was um, back when we first started the brewery, we were to get our beers into bottles. We were sending them away to a contract bottler. And at the time, that was Cameron's Brewery up near um, in 
um, Lancashire way. No, Hartlepool, Cameron. No, Hartlepool, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Just, I was thinking of Robinson's. My, my neck of the woods, though, I know where, I know I'm from the northeast, so I know Cameron's Brewery in Hartlepool. Yeah, I know that one. <laughs> um, and, um, and then we, you know, we were getting pallets of bottles back and then selling out and thinking, oh, well, we need to get some more bottled. And it got to the point where we were thinking, well, why are we sending our beer away to be bottled? Why aren't we investing in the equipment to do it ourselves? And so in 2007, that's when we kind of took the, the leap and, and put our own line in. And initially we just used it for our, our stuff, but the idea was always to kind of use it to, to, to try and use it to its full capacity. Cause otherwise it's just, you know, a very expensive equipment sitting there, not all, you know, not being used. Um, and so we, we started in the 2010 ish, um, really starting to kind of approach other breweries and offering it as a service that they could send their beer into us and we'll package it and send it back because, we're very fortunate because we have a farm, we're based on a farm that we have the space to expand into different sheds and to put lines in like that. Whereas lots of breweries, if they're in the back of a pub or just on an industrial estate, they don't often always have that space to be able to put their own packaging lines in. Mm. And it's for some breweries as well, bottles aren't such a major um, part of their of their offering. For example, there's, you know, there's a brewery down in, in um, Nottinghamshire that we deal with, but they, you know, their cask output would weigh outsell hours but bottle wise we would go more than them so they don't need a bottling line but they do need some bottles done every couple of months and that's we just thought it was a, a missed opportunity if we weren't offering that as a as a service mm. it makes sense doesn't it really that, that they're not going to invest in something you're effectively the cameron's brewery to them aren't you as you were in the yeah. Other days. yeah okay let's talk, let's talk about the site you've got for those who don't know, it is a fabulous place. It's it's a, it's got a beautiful views across the walls. But again, you've invested in. You've got a um, a, a bar and we do brewery visits. Uh, but you you've got a hospitality venue, which is essentially a really big um, uh, marquee that you can decorate out for weddings and family events, and it's fabulous. Um, that's obviously had a, an impact with COVID. What's your view on that coming back and people's confidence of, you know, holding a special event in a very special place? And how does that look for you for 2021? Well, it's really funny, actually, because we'd actually made the decision in 2018, early 2019, that 2020 was going to be our last year of doing the bigger wedding kind of style events, mainly because one, there was just a bit more competition for venues like us um anyway there was more opening up and so you know we were getting more kind of questions about kind of price and things um and we weren't ridiculously priced anyway and two you know it, it a wedding is a lovely event to host up at the brewery but it's very much it, it it doesn't allow a lot of flexibility with that around it so you've got to you know they have the venue from the the Thursday evening Friday morning to set up then the wedding's on the Saturday and then it's cleared down by the Sunday and then you're back at work on the Monday so you, we it only really left us with two or three days to be able to do any other events if we wanted to um within the the event space um and so basically covid was almost a blessing in disguise because it proved that we we had made the right decision but also it's been very frustrating because we really wanted to go out on a lovely, lovely back, you know, lovely kind of year of weddings. And yeah. as, it is, as it is, we've kind of gone from 18 weddings booked in 2020 to to five booked for 2021 that have carried over from, yeah. from 2020. So it's, it's kind of a little bit bittersweet in a way um, that we weren't able to, to really finish the season properly. You're going to enjoy it and you're going to end on a high because those five weddings that you got for this year, they've got a fabulous venue, fabulous place and access to fabulous beer as well, haven't they? So as well as other things. Let's talk a couple of things on production. How long does it take Alex to create ready for consumption a new batch of beer? What's the timing from we setting the brew up to it being available on the shelves or in a pub? How long's the timing on that? So from a beer being brewed to being sold via a hand pull in a pub you're looking at a week and a half to two weeks for it to be then into a bottle you're looking at another week on top of that so three three two and a half to three weeks to get it onto a shelf in a shop i think many of our listeners will be surprised at how short that time scale is you know you sort of get the impression don't you that they have to sit for ages and they have to ferment and all that stuff but 
so that's why you're able to do the capacity that you can do because it is shorter than we might anticipate then yeah yeah we do still always have to be thinking two or three weeks in advance or you know a month in advance of what stock we need because obviously you've got mm. to put it I mean, and that's on a good day, you know, you might get a beer that has a stuck fermentation and then it takes a lot longer, or you might have one that's absolutely ridiculously quick because it's nice and warm outside and, and then it, it's through much quicker. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, on a general general rule of thumb is two weeks for a cask beer and three weeks for a bottle beer. Yeah. So let's have a look at another question. Your brew names are interesting. Well, so how did you come up with the brew, the beer names, the concepts? Who's involved in the process and, and who decides the final name then? Um, well, so the historically, you know, the, the beers that we've had from day one, like Wall Gold and Wall Top Bitter uh, and Headland Red and things, they've been um, a combination of ideas from my parents who were, you know, original founders, friends of the family, um all in you know employees as well um but then kind of going forwards it's been much more design led in terms of we've had a consultancy with a design um, agency and we've said we're developing a new pale ale and a new dark beer kind of come up with some design concepts and names and things and if we really like the names and we'll go with it but sometimes we'll suggest a name or they'll suggest a name um, for example, our newest our low alcohol beer, Intuition, we, <laughs> this might sound a bit weird, we really liked the name Foresight, as in, you know, you've got the foresight to not think, to not have a hangover in the day before and all this, but I mentioned that to my dad and my mother-in-law and they both started giggling like school children because it had the word four in it and they associated that with something else that was a bit dodgy, so... <laughs> you know it was back to it was back to the drawing board and, and that's where intuition came from um but yeah I, I mean it's it's I wouldn't say we have a specific process but it's there's no science behind it by the sound of it then it's very much it is intuition then there's there's probably a, a, a thought yeah. process around the beat you've got to be careful though as well if you're exporting because what you know doesn't translate into Italian or French, you've got to be careful of, of, of certain words in, in different languages, haven't you, really? Yeah. Your, um, your design on the bottles, particularly in terms of the labelling and things, um, is that done in-house? Is that done with a design agency? Because you can tell, you can absolutely tell a world top beer when you see it. It's brilliantly well-branded. Is that external well, store? Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's the aim, is that we, we want somebody to be able to walk into a supermarket or a farm shop or a restaurant or a bar and see a wall top brand and think without even having to be up close to it to recognize that the color and the shape and the and the logo kind of style that that's a wall top beer um and that's one of the things we worked on about 10 10 years ago now we were we were a bit hit and miss with our branding you know some beers we were consistent with other beers if they were a seasonal we weren't that bothered about them and we would just slap something together and it wasn't very coherent so we, we stripped it all back. We, we talked to a design agency. They got into our heads. They started to understand what we wanted and then they've developed that. And then we've gone from there and we're still using them at, at the moment to just because of that consistency in the brand. And, you know, by all means, we refresh things every now and again. And we're just in the process at the moment of kind of redeveloping some of the logos and just kind of sharpening things up a bit. But to try and keep that that brand as consistent as possible it's like you know you'll always know that it's a Cadbury's product because of the purple it's it, they might change the logo and they might change the picture of the glass pour in the milk but you, you'll know that it's a, a Cadbury's product and that was the aim we're going for well what I would say is it definitely works as, as a big fan and, and obviously you know as a client I'm, I do spot it on the shelves I do take it off the shelves and, and, and consume your products as I'm sure you know Kate so that's good final question um, what's what's next? You've had a brilliant eighteen years uh, so far. You've coped with COVID in a, a, a new way of, of kind of diversifying again into ways of, of, of being successful. What does twenty twenty one look like for you? Um. Well, tw yeah, twenty twenty one is a bit weird. I'm um, I'm kind of looking more towards twenty twenty two now. If I'm if I'm honest. Um, we would really, we really want to get people back on site and enjoying the beer, you know, so fresh it's, you can see the brewery tanks kind of thing. So, you know, 
one of the you know the things that with not doing the weddings does mean that we've freed up a lot more time in the summer so we can do some beer festivals some live music nights some kind of you know pop-up clubs that kind of stuff and, and trying to trying to kind of really appreciate the the environment that we're in and enjoy being here um I don't know if this is a, a ridiculous idea or not but we would quite like to if we can get some form of a retail outlet of our own in a town or a village or somewhere you know not nothing major but somewhere you could go and have a dedicated kind of wall top tap that would be a really nice yeah. kind of option that we could get and just generally keep selling beer to be yeah. honest well, who doesn't like a beer festival? That's the first thing. Yep. And a beer festival associated with some music and a bar. What a fabulous idea. So, and given the diversification and journey you've been on over the last 18 years, who's to say you won't have that village retail shop where it's just it's just full of world gold and world top bitter and all your headland reds and things. That'd be a, a sight to behold, Kate. So listen, Kate, you've been an absolutely fantastic yep. guest. I'm delighted that we celebrated our 50th podcast with a beer. Not literally, though, but I will be cracking one to celebrate, and it will be... Uh, I, I do like your Headland Red, but I love your Marmalade Porter as well. I'm a big fan. Um, yeah. For those who regularly consume the podcast, you, you know it's available on uh, our YouTube channel. It's also available on Impactus Group's website. And on there, you'll be able to see links to iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Podbean, essentially all your, your favourite uh, podcast platforms. Uh, Kate's details are on this particular slide if you're consuming this by uh, video but I'll put Kate's contact details and the World Top Brewery website etc in the uh, the show notes as it were uh, but for now it just remains for me to say thank you Kate you've been a fantastic guest I'm glad to see that the business is going from strength to strength and uh, continues to do so so thanks again. Thanks a lot Nick thanks very much for having me. Good. Thanks.